bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, welcome, Fade to Black. Today is Tuesday, September 19th, 2023. Let's do this, man. Yeah, that's old school. That's old school fade to black right there. We're going to do that tonight. Our guest tonight is Joshua Cutchin. I have been waiting uh, to have uh, Joshua on the show for a very long time. Tonight's the night we're going to do this. Help support everything that we do around here. Get your fade to black t-shirts. The links are below. We have two. We have the original. We have the new Michael Oming hand-drawn official fade or not shirt you can get both and you can get it uh, with a game changer membership you can also get it by just ordering a shirt and the links are below we've got five shows this week i want to remind everybody about what is going on we're doing five shows so uh friday night is a very special presentation with melissa tittle she's going to be here we're going to be talking about uh, the peruvian mummies and also the uh, the press release about those mummies uh, that came out today. They they did more X-rays and CT scans yesterday. The Navy did there in Mexico. So we've got all of that on Friday night. Thursday, Linda Moulton Howe is here tonight. Joshua Cutchin. We're going to be talking about uh, well a lot of things tonight because Joshua's research. Uh, folklore, right? Uh, we're, we'll get into that. UFOs, little little Sasquatch, little big feet. We might do that too as well. And uh, death and the paranormal and the undead, ghosts, all of that stuff and their connections. We're going to do all of that and much more tonight. Joshua is the author of, he says, Seven, maybe eight, maybe nine books about the supernatural. He has appeared on dozens of programs, including, of course, Coast to Coast AM, and is regularly invited to speak at paranormal conferences. His latest nonfiction book is a two-volume set, Ecology of Souls, A New Mythology of Death and the Paranormal. In August of 2023, he released his first novel. Well, that's still a book, right? Them Old Ways Never Died. His website is joshuacutchin.com. I'm very excited to say, for the first time, welcome, Joshua Cutchin. You're there, man. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well, Jimmy. How are you? Yeah, this is going to be great. It's going to be a great conversation. But, and you know what's coming, the first time guest disclaimer. So let's get that out of the way, which is this. Joshua, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. And where that conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you go. You have Those to accept. my favorite kind of conversations. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, now this, I'm going to... What everybody, we're gonna get to the undead. We're gonna get to fairies. We're gonna we're gonna get to U of O's. Um oh, and the first question kind of has to do with all three, except it's not what you think. What is it, Joshua, about musicians, UFOs, and fairies? What 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 what, what what's the deal with that? There's something to it, isn't there? If you look back through all of some of the, you know, most uh, prominent musical figures uh, in in our, in our culture, there's always some sort of connection to to the hidden world and to the occult. You know, it's kind of interesting too how some of these melodies that we uh, we sort of gravitate to over the years sometimes have these arcane origins. I, I think of that, you know, sort of apocryphal tale about Danny Boy 
that lovely melody Danny Boy was actually supposedly a melody that was heard on the banks of a stream where the fairies were dancing and the first person who heard it was half asleep. Or, you know, if you look in the classical music tradition, which is a lot of my background, I'm a classically trained tuba player who's made the transition to jazz uh, in recent years. Um, you know, there's a, a famous uh, sonata by Tartini that was brought to him in a dream called the Devil's Trill Sonata, where the devil picks up the violin and tunes it and plays. So there is something to it. And I'm sure that you felt this when you've played, too, is that if if you get into sort of this flow state, sometimes you look back to recordings of yourself playing and you say to yourself, where did that come from? You know, I don't feel like it was me. I feel like I was channeling something. I was a conduit for something from beyond. So there is something special about music. I don't know if that really is an answer to your question but it's you're it's it, not just it, 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 yeah, yeah. It, 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 you know it has to I've, I've thought about this a lot i've talked to a lot of musicians uh about this subject because it's my journey right it's how i got here so it, it's got to be the same and the more that uh i have these conversations uh with musicians and where before it, you're gonna laugh about this okay so I used to keep my UFO stuff hidden, you know? Okay. And so like if they came over to my house, they would never know. It was like my porn stuff. <laughs> yeah. Therefore it was UFO stuff. Right. Okay. So, um, and then, then one day, like the conversation came up and, and I spun around. I was like, you, you what? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that that kind of triggered it with me where I started to have these conversations. And yeah, yeah, pretty much when it comes to the magic and and the 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 wonder, right, the pondering of of life being just a little bit different and not in this 2D reality. It's what a musician is all about, you know. And, and, it's it's Oaks. Go ahead. Sorry. And, and I, I, well, I was going to say, and artists, and painters, and sculptors, and poets, and writers. You know, that creative mind mm -hmm. is is allowed to go free, and I think that has something to do with it. I do too, and you know, I sort of have a similar experience myself. I go to the I go to these you know UFO conferences and stuff. I'm talking to my friends there, and they're like, "So what's up with the tuba?" And then I, you know, in between set breaks at the gig. They're like, so what's up with the UFOs? So I'm always the outlier, I guess, uh, regardless of where I go. But yeah, artists have always been chosen by whatever this is in the realm just beyond to, to serve as sort of intermediaries between those two worlds. I, that's my own personal opinion. And certainly I think you can find a lot of evidence for that. Yeah, and then you then you have uh, it, well well I, I'll wiggle this into UFOs. There's a method to my madness. All right, but then but then you have things like uh, the the folklore, the mythology of different musicians uh, throughout history that have made deals with the devil, right? That have mm -hmm. sold their soul, and that one day he couldn't play violin. The next day, right? And and, and you, you hear these, so Paganini is a, is a great example mm -hmm. of that. Um, and, and it's so the, the, the connection, right, of, of all of this is something that is, is part of pop culture as well. Yeah, and I think it's because I've always felt that music is one of the more slippery arts to try to to try to get your hands around you know, we can talk about a painting we can talk about poetry because you know those are words <laughs> we can talk about literature but to talk about music i think steve martin put it best he said writing about music is like dancing about architecture and, and i feel like that's a very apt description yeah 100 percent. and and then when uh, you start to Look at all of these different subjects, and with your background, which we'll get into in, in, in just a minute, you start to see that everything's kind of related. Everything is kind of connected, and it's not only our community and the things that we talk about here, but it's life, it's science, it's physics, it's mathematics, it's the universe, it's uh, you know, everything from the subatomic quantum to the biggest of the big seems to be connected. And that's the part that fascinates me the most. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I often feel that my interest in things like UFOs and 
cryptids and, and things like that. It's almost like a gateway for me to just appreciate aspects of learning that I might not appreciate otherwise. You know, my, you know, we'll go to a, I have two twin boys and we'll go to a children's museum and I'll find myself enraptured by some random exhibit because I'm making, you know, five steps of connections between that and, and something about UFOs or something about the strange. So I really think that it's sort of a, it, it in that sense, it sort of re-enchants all this stuff that you sort of end up taking for granted. Now let's let's back up for a second. I remember, uh, well, I'm going to say this was probably 20, 25 years ago, but I started to really talk about it on this program, where if we go back and pick a fairy tale, pick something, and it doesn't matter how far back you want to go. You want to go to ancient Egypt with it. You want to go to the Middle Ages. You want to go to Ireland. It doesn't matter. It, it, uh, North America, right? You go into this, this orated, you know, passed down from generation to generation stories. And you start to think, were they, were they talking about leprechauns? Or were, were they talking about yeah. trolls under the bridge? Were they talking about angels or fairies, right? Or UFO occupants. Or, yeah, yeah. Or, or were they talking about aliens and they just didn't have another word for it? Yeah, I think that's a very prescient observation. And that's something that I think is probably a good place to start is the fact that if you look at fairy folklore, you know, we tend to think of that being a Western European thing, but really it's it's a global phenomena. I would argue that any region that has, you know, a culture, so I guess any place but Antarctica, right, um, is going to have legends of these beings that sort of exist at the fringes of the community who tend to be, but are not exclusively, short who tend to be able to shape a uh, ship shift shape <laughs> pardon me um who tend to live underground and who are who are very fond of abducting people especially the most vulnerable members in our population so it does seem to be a worldwide construct but those core elements and some oddly specific things that we'll probably talk about in a little bit um get retained and just sort of the things, the way that we talk about them is what really changes. And that's what becomes culture specific and uh, time period specific. So, you know, sometimes I, I, I speak on this subject and people will say things like, um, you know, they'll say things like, oh, so the, you know, the UFO occupants were fairies and that gets me mad. And then I'll talk to people who say, oh, you know, the, the fairies were UFO, UFO occupants. And that gets me mad too, because what, what I'm always trying to get at is, I don't personally, for me, um, I'm not a big adherent to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. We can get into that later. But I, I think that we're always trying to describe this other intelligence that's interacting with us. And the name that we put onto it is almost entirely dependent on what is most popular and what is most acceptable and, and palatable in any given culture, if that makes any sense. Well, no. So you can flip that around then. That's a good debate. Okay, let's argue this point. You can you can actually flip that around to fairies and leprechauns and to elves that they they were extraterrestrials. Mm -hmm. And because of pop culture in that time period, they were deemed to be elves right. or the troll under the bridge. So it goes both ways, doesn't it? It does. And and that's sort of the goal. I, I think if you look at sort of the comparative disciplines, like uh, comparative folklore, or comparative religion, it isn't really to make a judgment call. So while I personally sort of distance myself from the extraterrestrial idea it is entirely valid to to think that these older stories are describing something that can be presented in a much more 21st century uh concept that would align with what we know about science um but i think my role and you know the, the role that the level of objectivity that I've tried to maintain <laughs> it comes and goes sometimes but my my role is to say i don't really know what either of these things are, but there appears to be some sort of connection between them. And there was a point in time where I used to say, you know, I, I think that the the fairy stuff looks a lot like the, the UFO stuff, but, you know, there are some outliers here and there. But it's gotten to the point, um, after looking at some, some things that just got a little bit <laughs> too specific to be coincidental in my eyes, that I started saying, yeah, I, I think it's kind of a one-to-one -one match because... Every time I think that I can't find 
a precedent for one and the other, I usually end up do. I usually end up doing that, um, you know, at some point as well, I as yeah, I continue to research. Yeah. So let's take that a step further. Then um, you're 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 sounding. I, I take this the wrong way. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're sounding hypocritical. Okay. Right. That you're you're you can go both ways, but you 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 don't know about the ET hypothesis. You, right. you want to you want to put that on the back burner, but yet you continue to make the connections. Well, no, so, it's yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Well, so is, is that hypocritical, or is there something more objective? I think I'm probably just not being as clear as I'd like to be. I I I, I tend to gravitate towards being sympathetic to those older interpretations of fairy folklore. I don't entirely discount the extraterrestrial hypothesis. I guess what I'm trying to get at is that my, my main aim in my research is to illustrate that these are talking about the same thing without making a judgment call on what it is. I mean, in, in my heart of hearts, I sometimes think or wish that it is kind of in some way that we can't even comprehend all of these things at once. That that's right. It is. That's, you know, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, um, I, I, I'll never forget the day I came on the air and I said, okay, I'm just going to tell you guys, uh, I care what you think. Fairies are real. Right. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and, and it was like, once I said it and I just got it out in the open, and there were reasons why I, I said what I said. And now it's, it's yeah. look, you're a big dude, right? I'm a big guy. <laughs> yeah. I, I would like to think that I'm, 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 I am, I'm masculine. Right. And, and I carry myself well. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll punch somebody in the throat if I have to. Right. <laughs> but fairies are real. And I don't give a crap. I don't. I don't care. You, you, you know what I mean. And so, yeah. what what do we do with that? And so the the descriptions of uh, ET are varied, but one of the descriptions that many people have witnessed is some type of clear ball with something on the inside of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody driving it with a stick shift, whatever. <laughs> and, and so we have, we have those descriptions. And I had somebody come up to me and go, I just took a picture of a fairy. I was like, oh, man, I don't, I don't need this right now. I don't, I don't, I don't. No, let me show you. Oh, God, are you really going to show me a picture of a fairy? When did you take it? A few minutes ago. Oh, God, all right, show me. <laughs> she takes out her phone, and in this picture next to this tree is this round ball, and in the middle of the ball is frigging Tinkerbell yeah. with the yeah. arms open, with wings, blonde hair. It's, 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 it's on. I go, Where'd you take this? I was, and she goes right there next to that tree. And I'm looking at the tree and I'm looking. And for the next three days, I'm out there with my phone walking around. Come on, fairies. Hoping, yeah. Come on, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, but that would, what was in that picture is what has been described for millennia. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think that. Uh, are fairies real, or is, or did she take a picture of ET cruising through the neighborhood? Yeah, I, I, I so <clears throat> backing up to your, you're talking about being a big guy. That's something that I ran into uh, when I had the, the good fortune of going to Ireland. Uh, it was kind of a mixed bag in terms of the conversations that I would have. You know, at one point, I distinctly remember being in a bar and them looking over at me and and my wife mentioning something about my interest in fairies and they just laughed. But I do remember talking to a 20 something who, who, you know, looked at me and said, I don't believe in fairies, but I'm scared to death of them. <laughs> and to this day, there are segments of the population that just won't go uh, to these historical sites at night. Um, and, you know, a, a lot of my work is, is also sort of done with the aim of rescuing how silly that sounds, because, you know, a lot of times when people talk about the reality of, 
of of ufos or bigfoot or something they'll say well it's not a unicorn or a leprechaun and you know i'm like well the leprechaun thing might have some truth to it um but because there is this consistency of of behavior uh that you see from the older fairy folklore that you can really transpose onto a lot of these modern phenomena again without the judgment that fairies are aliens or aliens are fairies it seems to be describing the same interaction with these non-human intelligences over the years um and it's just it really is pervasive in the way that a lot of those descriptions that you see from some of these older texts um you know walter evans winces the fairy faith in celtic countries is sort of a touchstone work uh that i go back to time and time again and i always find these little tidbits that are mirrored in some of this more modern literature and people do photograph fairies now the the appearance that you know your 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 friend's photo showed is is kind of a sticking point among fairy scholars because that sort of classic <clears throat> um winged small fairy is something that you really start to see creep in around the victorian era with you know some children's books and stage plays and such um you know fairies were always attributed the ability to levitate and to levitate others but they weren't necessarily depicted with those wings but at the same time there does seem to be a dialogue between our expectations for how these phenomena appear and behave and the way that the phenomena actually behaves i mean one one example that I always return to is um, there's this UFO scholar who is you know I think one of the great unsung scholars of the of the you know later 20th century by the name of Martin Kottmeyer and he's sort of the he's my go-to guy for hey Martin where was the first place that X Y or Z happened mm -hmm. and time and time again I, I'll find that you know some of the earliest stories of things like vehicular interference in the UFO literature don't necessarily come from cases I mean you can find antecedents earlier that weren't necessarily described as being flying saucers but oftentimes mm -hmm. these ideas will start in fiction and then somehow the phenomenon itself ad adopts and adapts to those expectations as well so within that framework it stands to reason i think that you know fairies can <laughs> appear however they darn well choose yeah well don't we have and and you're right it's always like a sign of the times mm -hmm. because we have uh, plenty of stories of you know headless horsemen and and uh, wild men of the uh, of the forest tipping over carriages and and attack it, it, it i mean that goes back centuries and centuries and it's the same thing that's happening today with automobiles or yeah or, yeah, or, <clears throat> yeah and, and you know i think that if you look at uh if you look at sort of the general electronic interference trope as it manifests obviously it never really happened before the advent of electricity but if you go back further you will find things like ghosts snuffing out candles you will find examples of this you know uh black dog running through a church in suffolk and shutting down the clock in the church so you still do see some of those um electronic interference motifs here and there they just seem to keep up with human development i mean it's sort of like the old valet idea of how you know the ufo in particular always seems to be a generation or two just beyond our capabilities you've got the steampunk airships in the early 1900s going to the um art deco flying saucers to the black triangles to now you know these these tic-tac drones that uh sorry these tic-tac balls of plasma that sort of behave like drones i'm not saying that they are drones but they sort of mm -hmm. again they're sort of they're indicative of the era in which we are technologically. And it always seems to be just beyond the horizon of technology. And I think that's really fascinating. And I, I suspect that it says something about the phenomena. But well, what would it say about the phenomena? Because I I look at it just as the way you suggested it. We have progressed. If you think about how we have progressed in that last hundred years, right? Think about that. 100 years ago, uh, well, we're in 2023, so now let's go 120 years ago. I used to be able to say 100 years ago in the year 2000. <laughs> it's still 2000, right? It's yeah, still 2000, yeah. yeah. yeah technic, technic. In my head it is, yeah. It, it, mine too, mine too. But if we think about it, uh, where we went from 1900 to 1970, right? Yeah. 1900... To 1970, one lifetime, one generation, 1900 to 1970, we went from covered wagons and gas lamps to Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. 
We, yeah. th- to think about that, everything that happened, uh, the flight, nuclear weapons, the jet age, uh, telephone, stereo, uh, the, uh, electronics, the internet, on and on. I, uh, we went to the moon, right? And 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 we have sent you know probes and satellites to to every planet in the solar system. Uh, we are now interstellar. We've got Voyager one and Voyager two that have left our solar system and have gone interstellar. So in 70 years. So why, if we've made that kind of progression, then what kind of progression has an extraterrestrial intelligence made in that same hundred year period? Yeah. Why wouldn't we be seeing different things here? Yeah. You'd think that it would be exponential to that degree. And I, I certainly think that, 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 uh, there's there's an there's an obvious argument or obvious analog to that in the way that our technology has 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 exponentially grown um and of course you know if you had a more sophisticated civilization it would sort of continue to grow and that i would imagine at an even faster pace um it, it it is interesting that sort of especially looking at the sort of the post-war explosion of technology that we had and there's been a lot of debate that's gone back and forth over the years as you well know about you know whether or not recovered craft somehow played a role in this i think that's that's possible um you know i also look to how weird a lot of folks who are innovators are um you know there's that famous example of carrie mullis who developed the um the uh, genetic sequencing, the PCR sequencing, um, who cr- who completely accredits that discovery to to LSD. Uh, in fact, there's that great story of Kerry Mullis being at his cabin, stepping outside and seeing a glowing raccoon that said "Good evening, Doctor Mullis" or something to that effect. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, that that the whole thing was a download. Yeah, you know, it, that's yeah, that's yeah. a that's a pretty heavy statement when you think about it. Well, and interestingly enough, the history of uh, of chiropractic is the same way. I wasn't aware of this until recently, but I had a friend alert me to the fact that uh, the the founder of chiropractic was sort of under the impression that this was channeled information as well. Um, so I, I also think, while I think that you know we we could be looking at this sort of exponential explosion in technology in terms of the material world, I also think that there is some other place that is also guiding our hands from time to time. And I know that might sound superstitious for some folks, but it's just this narrative that you hear time and time again. And of course, the further back you go in history, the, the more common it becomes if you're looking at artists and other innovators. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just, it's, I mean, it's kind of Diana Walker, Diana Walsh, Pasolka territory in that, in that way. But I think that that also is sort of playing a role in this, this advancement. I'm also sympathetic to the idea you know, as I alluded to earlier with the way that the, the fairy might be playing off cultural expectations in the example of your, your friend's photograph, that um, we might be meeting this phenomena halfway. Um, because, you know, it, it does seem incredibly adaptable. Um, you know, one generation's dead is another generation's demons is another generation's fairies is another generation's aliens. Um and I, I sometimes wonder if it's if it's just not <laughs> sort of capitalizing on that Ghostbusters, uh, you know, trope of of choose the form of your destructor. Um, I found it really interesting. Sorry, go ahead. I'm no, no, no. That's no. That's a that's a really great point. And I don't think I don't think you realize what you just said. The consistent. We have changed. We have adapted. We are different than who we were 100 years ago or 500 years ago. Absolutely, 100%. And our ability to understand uh, gets gets higher and higher every single day. But you know what has remained consistent? Ghosts, right? You know what True. has remained consistent? Fairies. That's you true. know, folklore the the these these tales and these experiences and and what has been you know passed down from generation to gen that has remained consistent i have not heard about i maybe it's out there but i haven't seen a fairy use a cell phone Right, and uh, yeah, it depends. It depends on what corners of the internet you're willing to go looking <laughs> into. But, but yes, broadly speaking, you're right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like, sort of like that old question that's often po- posited towards ghost hunters of you know, 
um, there, there does seem to be, to a certain degree, a, a, a half life associated with hauntings. You know, the 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 longer, the, the farther away you get from it, the less common it seems like the haunting is. Um, for example, we don't, unless you want to say that Bigfoot is Neanderthal ghosts, which I'm completely here for, right? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm right yeah. there with you, man. I'm right there with you. But, but unless you want to say that, like we don't have a lot of, you know, um, a lot of pre-human ancestor ghosts that we know of. So yeah, there does seem to be something about that. There's also this interesting thing, which I sort of ended up scratching my head over for some time, which is if you look at sort of the, the fairy sightings from... Oh, I don't know. Uh, the 19th century versus fairy sightings from you know last week. They're they're always in the same outfits, and I don't really know what to do with that because that would imply to a certain degree that the fairies in you know 300, 400 years ago were wearing contemporary clothing, <laughs> whereas nowadays you know we see them in these jerkins and these little caps and stuff that seem you know, frankly, medieval. Um, so I don't really know what to do with that. Uh, you know, there doesn't seem to be a, a uh, there doesn't seem to be an adaptation of clothing in these stories either. Unless, unless you want to go the, go the route of, of there being a connection between fairies and aliens. One of my favorite stories actually um, is from a gentleman by the name of Clifford Mushena, uh, who was, uh, I believe he was in Zimbabwe. Um, his story comes to us from the late UFO researcher Cynthia Hind, and uh, it was quite a quite a celebrated uh, story uh, in in that part of the world uh, because there was this rolling ball of fire that passed through his village, and Clifford goes to to shake the alarm bell because they all thought it was a fire, and as it turns out, there were these three beings and these shiny coveralls that appeared, and. Uh, Clifford was speaking with Cynthia Hind uh, and said to her, he said, uh, you know, people were, you know, people are, are saying that these were our ancestors. And Cynthia Hind says, with all due respect, I think that your, your ancestors would have been clothed a little bit differently than these shiny spacesuits. And Clifford says, times change. <laughs> and I love that attitude because um, it, it implies something very strange about a spirit world, if there is one. Um, this idea that, that you know, we like to think of an afterlife or fairyland or, you know, Middle Earth or whatever you want to call this other place, this other dimension. We like to think of it as static, as not really evolving and technologically or culturally or in any sort of ways. But that sort of simple statement that Clifford made um, certainly harkens back to the idea that there is another realm that also sees advancement in the same way that ours does. And interestingly enough, that... You can find that in a lot of ancient cosmologies as well, of like ancient China or you know, ancient Egypt, where the afterlife was a place where you would go to sleep, get up, work in the work in the fields, go to worship, <laughs> eat, drink, sleep, go to the bathroom, all those things, and would also be capable of its own technological development where you might build a building in the afterlife. So I think this idea of thinking of these things as being static is it might be an erroneous one. Now, okay, so let me ask you this. Thor Ragnarok. Let's just go there for a second. All right, and so when you look at the, you go to Ragnarok and you look at the, 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 I almost said costumes. It's costumes because it's a movie, but you look how uh, everybody is dressed. Another planet, right? And then another realm and all of that. But the, there is a mix. I would say that they are fashion forward, fashion conscious. <laughs> That's probably fair. Yeah. But, but medieval at the same time. So now let's go to now here on Earth, right? And if you saw a uh, Thor or a fairy or, or something like that, uh, that would appear to be medievally dressed, but if you took a closer look, maybe it's fashion forward, a fashion forward version of what they do, like in you know in Thor Ragnarok, which and I think you understand what I'm trying to suggest I here. I do, I do, and and I think that to a degree, um, 
and I know I, I might be trying to fit a square peg into a round hole by sort of going here time and time again, but I think to a degree, the UFO phenomenon kind of kind of does that. Um, you know, one of the things that I always find really interesting because I don't really know what it says about the alien abduction scenario, but it but it it says something about it. The fact that all these techniques that you saw in the 1980s, especially, and you still don't see them today, are invasive really comically so you know it's like they're coring out parts of your body for dna samples meanwhile in 2023 i can go down to the cvs and they can swab the inside of my mouth and get everything that they need you know um so it, it almost implies to me that, that that's almost like a more primitive form of of sample gathering than we would expect from an advanced civilization which leads me down the the line of thinking that it might be done for another purpose besides the explicit purpose of medical intervention on their behalf. It might have something to do more with the, the sort of pageantry and maybe even if you want to go down this, down this route, uh, the, the fear level as well um, makes me think that there might be something to that at play. Now let's take it a step further. Okay. Is there when we when we talk about the the possibility of and i like the is sasquatch a, a ghost in the Andertal, <laughs> right are are we looking at interactions that are with something that was recorded in the ether that is from a different time that we're seeing now or is it from another dimension and we are seeing it in real time, and then they just go away, and that's why we can't turn around. And what is the reality, or is it again like everything else? Is it a mixture of all of the above? Well, I, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that because that's sort of where I keep on finding myself going to. Is that it's it's probably a mixture of a lot of those things. Um, you know, time slips, perhaps. I mean, I so I, I started out. Bigfoot was kind of my my gateway drug, <laughs> and uh, and it was because I thought that one day we would you know bag and tag a Bigfoot. We would be able to shoot one, and we'd have a, a body. It's right. just around the corner any day now. Um, but you know, the older I got, the more I did become uh, sympathetic to some of the skeptical uh, some of the skeptical counterpoints. You know, people will say things like, "Well, you don't often run into." carcasses of bears or cougars so that could be a similar thing at play with the bigfoot and i'm like yeah but people have uh, you know at, at some yeah, point yeah, people yeah. Have, yeah. 100%, 100%. Um, you know uh and, and i'm aware of all the the, the uh the cryptozoological cryptozoological counter arguments to that like oh bigfoot might bury their dead or you know porcupines like to gnaw on bones of animals i i get all that but i'm saying that like i would think that there would be something you know a little bit more concrete now granted we do have hair and we do have footprints which would seem to imply a physical phenomenon um one of the things that i oftentimes get called out for when i talk about bigfoot being something like a ghost or an interdimensional being is is this idea of well ghosts don't leave footprints and i'm like wait a minute wait a minute Did, have you ever read your parapsychology <laughs> like your parasite like, like that was one of the first ghost hunting methods was to spread out talcum powder on the floor and wait for footprints to appear. Ghosts slam doors. Ghosts seem to throw things. So this idea, I think the the idea of big, that Bigfoot has to be purely physical is predicated on this this false assumption that we have between the physical and the non physical being completely separate. And I think that there's probably some some middle ground in there. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's something that uh, that Carl Jung talked about quite a bit in Mysterium Conjunctionis. Is that is that the idea that there might be some sort of quality of state of being that has both a material and a, and a non-material quality, a material and a psychic quality. So I'm, I'm, I'm more sympathetic than I ever was as a, as a youth to the idea of Bigfoot being stranger than just a big monkey in the woods. Um, and part of that's because, you know, I completely, I, I talk to these people. I really do. Like, I talk to these people who see something cross the road in the middle of the night, and they say it looks like a giant hominid, and, and I believe them. I'm not saying that they're wrong. Um, but but I do find, after sort of looking at the, the question of Bigfoot's origins or whatever Bigfoot might be for, for several years now, I have found this trend where the people who have those quick sightings, the hunters, the motorists etc 
they are the ones who tend to gravitate towards the idea that it is a, a, a flesh and blood primate without any sort of weird characteristics. But once you start talking to the habituators, um, which are the people that I'm sure you know um, claim to have like Bigfoot on their property, that's when you get the stories of my camera stopped working all the time. Um, our, also, our house is haunted. Also, I saw some weird balls of light <laughs> floating through the trees. And that's when you start to say, oh, this is kind of sounding weird. You know, I I often say that uh, if you can get the uh, the speaker at the Bigfoot conference to the bar and get a couple of beers into him or her and then say, so have you ever seen anything strange on these Bigfoot outings? Um, a lot of them, in my experience, will say things like, well, there, this one, there was this one time where we were on this property that was supposed to have a lot of Bigfoot activity. We didn't see Bigfoot that night, but we did see these, these orbs of light. Um, so it's not proof positive that Bigfoot is something beyond the physical or something beyond this reality or beyond this dimension. Um, you know, I'm very much a fan of the idea that maybe there is a population of relic hominids that, uh, is sometimes used as a screen memory of sorts for whatever lies behind the UFO phenomenon. We know that the UFO phenomenon does that with mundane animals like deer and owls and birds and other animals. So why not <laughs> this Bigfoot creature as well? That's my sort of way to have my cake and eat it too. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I think that uh, there is something even stranger about Bigfoot than it just being a, a big ape. I, um, I, uh... I'm on the fence when it comes to Bigfoot. Right? Mm -hmm. and, I, totally, but, I totally understand it. But yet, uh, you know, I accused you of being hypocritical, right? <laughs> I, I am a walking hypocrite. And uh, for so many different reasons. And, and, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think that if you, if you appear to speak out of both sides of your mouth that I do. I do it every night on this show, man. I do. I do. I do. I do. Is that you have an open mind that you are willing to, you're not closing down one side or the other. Yeah. But, but here is where I've, I've, I've just got it wrong. If, if the UFO community had a piece of footage like the Patterson Gimlin film, it would be case closed. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, but yeah, yet, totally, but yeah. yet, but yet it's not enough for me. Right. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, what you it's mean. like the most, it's, it's like, you know, Jimmy, uh, you're making an ass of yourself, man. You cannot have, you can't have it both ways, but yet that's where I am. Well, and I, I, I totally get it. And I think like that's sort of like, I, I, again, I think that you hit the nail on the head. That, to me, is the sign of someone who is able to mul to entertain multiple possibilities at once without sort of landing on anything. I'm a big fan of saying that I have three baskets in my head, one labeled true, one labeled false, and the, um, and the middle one says interesting if true. And that basket is enormous. <laughs> and the true and the false baskets are pretty tiny, um, you know, when it comes to this stuff. Like, obviously, I know my home address and, and whatnot. But when it comes to these topics, I, I, I entertain a lot of different ideas. Um, and you're right. I think the Patterson Gimlin film is, is a great example of that. There was some research and I wish I could credit him or her with uh, them saying it, but they said that either way, that footage is remarkable because either it's, you know, an actual f f video of, of a, of a large undiscovered primate, or it's a hoax that has somehow managed to, uh, you know, retain a degree of believability for decades. So I think that that's, that's an interesting way to, to approach it. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's also one of the things that I, I think in order to really get to the bottom of this, we have to look at a lot of different possibilities for things. And one of the reasons I keep coming back to this, the power of fairy folklore is because it even manifests itself in, in Bigfoot stories. And, and I, it seems like the last place that you'd expect that, but there are lots of different things that uh, you'll hear from Bigfooters that, that seem like they're taken right out of, out of the fairy folklore. When, uh, it, okay. So you have a group of skeptics, right? And you have uh, the world of atheists, the world of physics, the world of science and, and the Richard uh, Dawkins of the world. Right. And, and so, um, and, and they're, 
Mary, it's a small community. It's it seems bigger than it is, but it's it's a very they're just very loud, right? They they seem they seem bigger than they are, but but they're yeah, not. Yeah. But but in that world, they they want you. Those physicists literally will stare you in the face and say, "Entanglement is real," <laughs> right? Yeah. Quantum quantum computers run in a parallel world. Uh, uh, the multiverse, eleven dimensions, right? They they, they want to convince you of all of this, and it's like, well, wh- wh- wait a minute here, and 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 you don't believe in what? And, and aren't you talking about interdimensional things? And if all of this that you are trying to get you and your non-spiritual 2D uh, fan base uh, to to laugh at people that are spiritual or 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 wonder about the world and and have fascinating fun lives, you want to tease us, but yet, right? Entanglement, yeah. really? Uh, and it, it's it's like it's the exact same thing. It, well, it's it, one of the most fascinating arguments there is. It's like Terrence McKenna used to say about the Big Bang. He used to say, "Just give us one good miracle, and we'll take care of the rest." You know, <laughs> and, and it really does seem that way. I mean, yeah, I, I think that you could you could make a, a cogent point that a lot of this pontificating on multiverses and quantum this and quantum that sort of becomes that old um, medieval church argument of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Like it, it doesn't have any sort of applied app. It doesn't have any sort of application in our reality. And it's it, it, to, to a degree it is, it is again, a, a, an assumption that's based on, based on faith. Um, and I, I, I do get bothered with that. I think that that crowd, you know, I, I feel perpetually stuck in the late '90s and early 2000s when I think about that sort of new atheism crowd, but um, it's it's less pronounced than it than it was back then, and I I, I do take heart in that. Um, I, I I think I, I think I see a lot of more people um, going in the direction of spirituality. Uh, there's certainly a uh, certainly a paganism that's uh you know blossoming in a lot of ways astrology is on the rise so people are interested in these things and they sort of realize that that they do realize that there are a lot of of things beyond what we've been told and uh you know i always find it really interesting that uh that a lot of the atheist models are sort of reincarnative in scope you know it's that old saying we are star stuff well that's that's uh, it's not mystical because it does have a, a basis in reality, but it does um, speak to the same emotions that a lot of these older traditions do regarding things like reincarnation. Here it's here's the thing, and I'm watching I'm watching the chat right. There's somebody in the chat. Don't don't look at the chat. There's somebody in the chat saying uh, things like, "But entanglement has been on this show for the last ten years." And that my fascinated it is one of the things entanglement entanglement w- it proves proves telepathy communication faster than light the thought in the speed of now and it answers all of the questions on channeling on where this comes from at, at, at from the other side of the universe. Right. But yet, but yet a physicist will say, eh, I don't believe in ghosts or UFOs. <laughs> and and once you once you introduce those variables that you were talking about, then it puts a lot of stuff back on the table in terms of what this could be. You know? Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, uh, entanglement and and uh, the ideas behind string theory, right? The, just the, the theory behind it. I have, uh, you can see what I have behind me, right? I have a lot of strings, and those strings vibrate at a frequency. And when I hear Brian Green talk about string theory and how it, it, it's it's fundamental ideas behind it, I totally get it and understand it. You know why? Because I can do this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because that's string theory. So if if you're going to convince me of that, don't tell me 
that uh, E.T. does not have a way to get from there to here in an instant, that fairies can't come and go through through dimensions or through portals, or that Bigfoot possibly uh, could be interdimensional, because you're telling me that entanglement has been proven, and I agree that it has. It, 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 it's, it's the world that we live in, and it's, it's about to collide. Mm-hmm. That world, right, that spiritual world that uh, our community and the world of science, man, it's going to hit head on. It's going to be nasty when it happens. Yeah, it it definitely feels like that. And and that's part of the reason that I'm so glad that you keep on resonating with my my saying, hey, it could be all these things because, you know, you talk about entanglement and string theory and things like that. And that's how you get interdimensional alien ghosts you know <laughs> it really is <laughs> because you know, thing. well you know yeah. we, we in these communities we like to quibble over things like oh i think they're interdimensional or i think they come from here or they come from there but if you start like taking a ten thousand foot view of a lot of these different ideas they all just point to intelligences not in this reality coming from somewhere else and i start to think that all these these uh variations on that idea that we set up are, are kind of just constructs um you know i i i think that uh, there's this great conversation that i found between the late brad steiger and the ghost hunter hans holzer and uh steiger saying you know i always thought that you know the ufos or or you know these these other intelligences come from another dimension and hans holzer says well how's that any different than the afterlife and, and brad steiger goes uh i guess it's not <laughs> something to that effect I, I think these are these are these are these are human names predicated on language, and b- by that very nature, they're going to be they're going to carry with them a certain artificiality. You know? What are we going to do? Because you just touched upon it, right? And and I love that that uh, that Hans Holzer uh, quote because we have three fundamental questions. I, I think three, both from a philosophical side and, and a pop culture side and a generational side that, that goes back to the dawn of man, which is who are we? Where do we come from? Right. Um, uh, what happens after we die? And are we alone in the universe? Right. These three fundamental, unanswered, unanswerable situations well the are we alone in the universe side is being addressed right now right now in the media in the military in our community it witnesses congress hearings it's like it's insane it's being written into law right it's on the books in our legislation that that part what are we going to do if that gets answered that's the thing, Jimmy, that I, I keep on coming back to is because, um, you know, because you end up sort of having to stay abreast of, of all these developments and whatnot, um, clips of, of the interview between jo- uh, Joe Rogan and Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp came my way. And I, I did watch the section where they were discussing, uh, you know, well, what could be the, what could be, what secret is so, um, is so important that it has to be guarded this closely and it's 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 those secrets that you just mentioned. Like those are the those are the secrets right there. Those those are the things that I mean. You want to talk about disrupting a society? Those are the things that are truly disruptive. I mean, I I, I, I imagine what a world would look like if there was this disclosure, not necessarily of you know just that we aren't alone, but that oh yes, and you also when you die, you make a transmission transition to another dimension. So you're sort of an eternal spirit that comes back here <laughs> every, every generation. It's like that it's, it's like I've said before, um, which ver- which of these two things would upend your reality more? The revelation that reality actually looks like close encounters of the third kind or the revelation that reality looks like the Iliad <laughs> or the Odyssey or something like that. Like I know which one affects my day-to-day life more. I mean, I, I can wrap my head around, you know, extraterrestrial scientists, but the idea that there are these other sort of mystical things going on, like that has a more, uh, that has a greater impact on my, on my live day-to-day reality for sure. 
But aren't we talking about the same thing? We are. And, that's, and not, that's, yeah. Yeah. And, and not to not to regurgitate this, but that that statement is what we have mentioned like twenty times since the start of the show. Whether yeah, it's, it's the collision and point. Count, yeah, 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 it's a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Because if 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 that is indeed the case, right, where we are um, facing facing a reality that that could be a paradigm shift, and we have been warned about this, and we have thought about this forever, but now that it seems to be here, it's kind of like meh. Right where I I don't know I don't know now I not to say that Corbell and Knapp uh, are not right or are even wrong I'm not sure that anybody has has the real answers but but I don't know if people really give a crap as to what the secret is that that is being withheld yeah I think they moved on from that point. Rent still due on Friday, you know. That's I mean, right. That sort of That's thing. Right. <laughs> I mean, I so and and, and here's the thing. I, I sometimes have a little bit of a rap um, in some spaces for being uh, a cynic when it comes to issues of disclosure, and it's not because you know you scratch every cynic and you'll find someone underneath who is an idealist who had their heart broken too many times. You know what I mean? And uh, and that's sort of me is 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 I just I, I I'm I'm skeptical of something of that magnitude coming from an authority structure, and I'm even more skeptical of with the way we are as a planet of, you know, fifty percent of the population believing it. You know, it's I, I um I I'm, I've grown fond of saying uh, I I had a panel at a convention a couple of weeks ago, and and I I said. Uh, that I, I just don't think that whatever happens in this disclosure season, I, I don't really know if we're prepared to accept it as a majority, because I said, think of the person you didn't vote for last election. Now imagine that they're president and now imagine that they've said that aliens are real. Do you believe them? <laughs> and like where we are, I just don't see that happening. Yeah. You know? Well, but and here is the, it, you're presenting a conundrum. And the conundrum is this. I, 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 I have said many times publicly in front of large crowds and on this show that I don't need disclosure. I've seen what I've seen. I, I don't need, I, I, I don't need, do you know what kind of grumbles that creates? Yeah. Because I am not empathetic to those out there I'm not presenting any empathy to those out there that um, have had an experience, but they can't talk about it because their husband or their wife um, is is somebody that's not going to take part in that conversation, or or their employer, or so, uh, your your schoolmates, your friend. Right? You don't want to alien, and you don't want to be called crazy. So the only thing that they are waiting for, Joshua is that head of state that statement from the white house on That's live true. tv so they can turn around and go see <laughs> i'm not right? crazy i'm not the right, only right, one right yet. And, and you know i'm not i'm not that mean so uh, I, I i look at it that way now i have to we yeah. have to look at the masses now in the other part um i, I want to address what you had just said the other part is this I think that for those in the world, not everybody has seen a Hollywood movie. There are people very, very poor. There are people that uh, are not uh, in a in a technical environment, um, and and so forth. So I, I get that there are people out there that have not heard Fade to Black. I know that that sounds crazy, or Coast to Coast, or I've <laughs> never seen Ancient Aliens, or know who Giorgio Tsoukalos is. Um, they don't know who Joe Rogan is. They don't have a clue, right? So that's about half of the world's population, as crazy as that sounds. So I'm not speaking to them, but the ones that are connected into technology and have the internet and have cell phones, and they know that the universe is a big place. They know that there's tons of life out there, and they assume that we're being visited. And I just don't think so that, that half of the world that, that, that is connected into the internet. 
you know, that 4 billion people that are on Facebook. Yeah. That, that's, this stuff is not a surprise to them. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and sometimes I think that that's maybe why we're not seeing uh, such a reaction <clears throat> from the public given recent disclosures is because we're kind of like, okay, yeah, we know. Can we just see it at this point? Like, can we, can we just see what you have? But, there is something interesting that I think has gone on over the decades, which is um, the phenomenon itself, whatever it is, um, I think uh, has sort of operated at the grassroots level. And it's, it's, it's come into people's lives individually with the idea that, you know, you have to, if, if you, if you pay too much attention to the forest, you'll miss the trees or to use another analogy. Um, if, if you just try to, if, if you don't actually plant every individual seed, you're not going to get a harvest. And I think that's, you know, that, that's why I, I'm a fan of like still trying to push for things like disclosure, because, you know, just from an ethical standpoint, transparency is a thing that we all need. But I do think that, as you alluded to, you know, you don't need disclosure. You've reached that point yourself. It's become sort of a personal gnosis. I mean, you don't have to have an authority to tell you that these things are real. You can find your way there yourself, um, whether it's through having a direct experience or it's something that looks a little bit more like I've done, which is sort of Goldilocksing my way into b- believing that these things have some objective reality to them. Well, but isn't that isn't that the point? Isn't that the point? If you if you there are okay so i just talked about those 4 billion connected people right mm-hmm. out of those 4 billion i would say that the majority would say universe is a big place there's it, it's full of life there's no question about it. we cannot be all there is right but they they don't believe in ghost <laughs> or or yeah. they don't they don't think about the afterlife they don't have a spiritual. They don't wonder about dreams. They don't. They synchronicities happen to them all day long, and they don't notice. And that's that's yeah. that's a really strange part that the majority of the world, the majority, probably doesn't think about these things at all because the rent is due. Right. They've got to pay their car insurance. They've got to go to work. They've got to do their thing, and they have been programmed into this existence about not thinking about something else. Yeah, that's part of the grip of the materialist paradigm. And, you know, I, I talk about materialism shortcomings, the idea that, you know, just the measurable, physical, quantifiable things are all that exists. I talk about shortcomings and comings, and people are, people are like, well, you know, but what about knee replacements and airplanes and this and that? I'm like, okay, you can still keep those advancements. Like I'm not saying you have to toss all those things out, but I'm saying it's not necessarily an accurate depiction of, of the true reality of, of the true nature of reality. I guess I should say it's one of those map is not the territory sort of things. And I think if you look at the UFO in, in particular, it, it becomes a challenge to that, that idea in a lot of ways, even if it is, this is the thing that I keep on trying to emphasize, even if it is as simple as little green scientists from another planet coming here, there are so many stories that feature telepathy. I mean, so many stories that feature telepathy, even when you don't have UFO occupants that are seen, you still sometimes have telepathic communication between the witness and the craft where the craft will respond to people's thoughts or people's expectations, or they say things like, it would be really neat to see a UFO and pop a UFO appears in the sky. So, that by definition is is something beyond the the material the the existence of telepathy and have it is, done, it is have, a, you, yeah. have you done that i try all the time and it never happens for me <laughs> what <laughs> but, oh, but you i need to, you need yeah. to come hang out with me i you do I, 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 well I, I i've gotten i've i've uh, i've let me split how's the most delicate way to put this i've i've gotten a lot of the prescriptions for how to do that i just haven't um engaged in them but um but yeah, I, I I just think that uh, that th- the very aspect of UFO contact, even in some of the most mundane cases, just blows apart our understanding of what reality is. And it's kind of it's kind of funny to me that you will have people who do believe in aliens, but can't just go a little bit further and and see how a lot of these more supernatural aspects of their day to day lived experience also are worth examining. You know? 
It, it, the I, I have so many uh, friends, and I've, I've done many shows uh, with researchers that have never seen anything. You know, and it's, well, I didn't say it, that. It, well, <laughs> I didn't say well, that. Well, well but but well, I, I, I'm I'm referring to you know a flying saucer, right? Right. Is, right. You know, and so, but check this out. All right, this was uh, uh, last weekend. I was in Colorado. Week before that, I was in the United Kingdom. The week before that, so this is like three weeks ago, right? Maybe four, four, okay. uh, four weeks ago. I was in Palm Springs uh, with Billy Carson, and uh, we got a, a crew together. It's about twenty people uh, for a private uh, sky watch. So we get together out in Palm Springs, and we go out to Giant Rock, one of the coolest places on, on planet yeah. Earth, just because it's the biggest rock, right? right? So that that in of itself is is cool, celebratory. So we're out there, and we're on the top of this mountain. And and this is what happens. Now, this is this is this sounds unbelievable, but check this out. And I wish you would have been there because it's a paradigm <laughs> shift. It's a, it's a life changing thing. So uh, uh, all twenty of us are on top top of this hill, and uh, off would have been to the west. Uh, I'm facing this way, so uh, I'm facing south to the west, and this orange. Bright, and this is probably nine o'clock at night. It's not totally black yet, right? The the sky uh, off to the west, it's still a little light blue. You know, you know what I mean? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. But, yep, uh, yep. Above us, it's black. Okay. And off to the west is this bright orange light, just standing out in the sky, and it's coming towards us, like straight. It's coming straight at us. And Billy, who's standing next to me, says these words. That's a plane. Nobody shine the lasers on that or we'll get in trouble. That's a plane. And I'm kind of looking at him like, okay, all right, okay. We got night vision and we got all, you know, and I'm just kind of checking it out. I'm looking around at the other side. It's getting closer. Man. I don't know, man. I don't know. And it's not it's not going very fast. Mm -hmm. And it's not very high. And then it flies right over us. And now I got the night vision on it. There's no lights. It's it's not a plane. It's just a glowing orange Light. ball. Yeah. Bright. Bright. Glowing. And it's right up right over us. And then as it gets to like 12 o'clock, like right above us. This thing goes just like this. And it goes straight up, straight up, straight up, 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 turns into a star and disappears. Now, and then Billy, <laughs> Billy, Billy, and Billy, I know he's listening right now, okay? And, mm -hmm. and on all that I love, this is what comes out of Billy's mouth. I reserve the right to say, that wasn't a plane. <laughs> <laughs> I take it all back, guys. Yeah, take it yeah, all back. Yeah. Now, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? Neil deGrasse Tyson, what do you do with that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. What, what, what do you do with that? Explain that to me where that's going to make terrestrial sense. Yeah, it 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 doesn't. And that's... The, the the confounding thing to me is is how we can be faced with these things time and time again and we can even have trace evidence you know in some of the more dramatic examples um but yet there's this stubborn refusal i mean so i talked about the the different baskets in my head for for true false and and you know interesting if true and uh one of the things in my true basket is is psi phenomena um because if you look at the research of folks like Dean Radin, um, like Daryl Bim, I would say, like Rupert Sheldrake, um, they're, they're playing by all the rules. Like in a lot of these scenarios, they're using the right controls. They're they're proving things, I think, beyond a seven sigma level in terms of, you know, uh, accounting for random chance and whatnot. And yet they're still ignored by the establishment. And it does start to look a little bit more like uh, this sort of 
uh, it can't be true, so therefore it isn't mentality. I, I re recall, I wish I had more details uh, in front of me, but I recall relatively recently there was a uh, there was a paper that was talking about, it was originally written about a psi experiment, but they submitted it in another paper with, you know, the word psi subbed out for some sort of other mundane known condition. And the one that was substituted out with the mundane known condition was accepted and the one with psi and it was, you know, it was rejected. So there's just this, this barrier to, uh, there's this barrier to acceptance that I think is, is it's crumbling, right? It's getting better, um, but it's still strong. And, and that's, that, that's why I think that, you know, there's, there, there are going to be some people when, when this becomes, these things become so obvious that they can't be ignored. They're just, they're either going to, I think they're either going to have their world collapse in on them um, or they're just going to live in some degree of denial, but. You know, I guess that's no, I, they've got I, some time I, between now and then. And I hope that's not the case. I hope it doesn't go down that road. What I'm hoping is that most of the intelligentsia out there will say it's 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 all about data, it's all about repeatability, it's all about you know measuring. And, you know, they want that tangible side of things so they can look at it and be analytical and, and then determine, right? Well, if, if it gets to that point where it, it becomes data and it becomes something that could be measured and, and tested and, and observed, then it's case closed. Right. And I, I think that they would be on the side of the fence very, very quickly. I, I, the the ideas that are being presented right now, which are, are mind blowing, that maybe maybe the Big Bang never happened, that 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 time is forever, mm -hmm. and that uh, this measurement that we have been right, and the existence of everything is is forever and it's infinite. And that the universe will continue to expand into the infinite uh, and, and run into another universe that is on the other side, expanding this way. These are concepts that just a couple of decades ago would have been laughed at. It's true. It's very true. I mean, you know, I, I think that in my more cynical moments, I think that they'll adopt all this new data once they figure out how to market it <laughs> you know like that's that's certainly the thing if they can put it in a pill or something um but uh yeah I mean, right that's, 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 that's um, a really 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 good point that's a really and cynical it, point but it's a, yeah it, it, well it's not that cynical no not really because if uh uh one of the uh, one of the arguments that we hear over and over again, uh, and I, I don't want to, and I don't want to sound like some walking hypocritical paradox, but but this is this is the reality of the situation that um, if we back up three hundred years and we get to Isaac Newton, right? We get to Isaac Newton. That is when everything changed, and most people don't recognize that. Isaac Newton was a frigging alchemist. Isaac Newton was a biblical scholar. Isaac Newton was a philosopher. Isaac Newton was a mathematician. Isaac Newton was spiritual. Isaac Newton was a physicist. Isaac Newton gave his gravity, but he believed in the baby Jesus, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and he was chasing the philosopher's stone. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, yeah. and, 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 and we don't have that. You're not allowed to be Isaac Newton anymore. Well, it, it also reminds you, me of, you know, uh, when Descartes was was sort of got his his message about or his inspiration for pursuing, you know, the world rationally. It was a vision from an angel who said that he would use measure and number to quantify his surroundings. So it, it again ties into that 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 conversation we had earlier about there being some sort of inspiration from somewhere else that sort of drives human progress. Well, it, and why, why can we not have 
a, a, a philosophical discussion when talking about quantum theory. <laughs> What's wrong with that? I mean, I just, I, I don't know why that can't come from the same mind. And you're right, right. about Descartes and, and others, where if, if, if we look into deep history, deep, deep history, let's go Egypt, let's go uh, newer history, Greece, right, Rome, where uh, a philosopher was the scientist in the neighborhood, right? They were the mm -hmm. same, for, and the doctor, right, and the teacher as well. Uh, but you can't do all of those things today. Yeah, that was sort of was was sort of tragic. Uh, shortly before his death, I believe um, Stephen Hawking made that comment about philosophy being dead or useless or something to that extent. It's like didn't didn't used to be this way because you know it's what's that um that saying uh, teaching STEM without the humanities is how you get Spider Man villains. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, right. it, it is, you know, it is. Um, and, you know, that's, that's something that's been a big push um, from Dr. Jeffrey Kripal is this, this urge to get the humanities more involved in, you know, things like the UFO question. And I think that there might be some real value in sort of staking a claim in the unexplained because it is going to have such profound implications, staking a claim in that with the humanities alongside the sciences so that we don't end up taking it to places that put us all in a, a bunch of peril, you know, the, the um, I mentioned this a lot, but I'm, I'm, it, it fits into this discussion. Uh, and for those of you that are new to the show uh, here tonight, you're going to hear this for the first time is this in, in Brian Greene's uh, uh, latest book. Uh, I think it's called till the end of time or, or something. Uh, I've read it like a hundred times, whatever the title of the book is. But uh, Brian, who I love uh, a, a lot, I, I really respect him a lot, but <laughs> right, he still runs with that crowd, right? He'll still sit with, with Dawkins or, or Sam Harris or whatever and have these atheist laugh-a-thons and discussions of free will and consciousness and, and, and laugh it all off. But this is where he is the walking hypocrite because in, in the end of his book where he takes everything from the beginning and he pushes it out a hundred trillion years and what happens, right? Okay. So what happens over a hundred trillion, what, what, what is going to be here a hundred trillion years from now, right? And it's a lot of zeros, right? It's a big expanse of time. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so, you know, we're at 13.8 billion years. So if you're looking at a hundred trillion years down here, 13.8 billion years is like the thickness of the dust on my fingers. It's, it's beyond comprehension. Yeah, yeah. How, yeah. how the scales how, are working with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, right, 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 right. It's just beyond what we can comprehend. But he says at the end of everything, right, all that is going to be left is thought and thinking. There will be clouds of thinking thought floating in the vastness of nothing. Now, is he saying consciousness? Is that his way, right? Is that his way? Of, of getting right. around the spiritual question or the consciousness question without offending his fan base and, and writing it in those terms, because that is exactly what he's saying. Well, and, and that's part of the reason that, you know, um, I have a good friend of mine, Miguel Romero, who goes by the name Red Pill Junkie. Um, he's often talked about the fact that he's not convinced that there isn't some form of life in our solar system because, we have such a poor grip on what consciousness is. He's not entirely sure. And I, I, I like playing with this as a thought experiment. He's not entirely sure that we would recognize consciousness in all of its different forms. And if you look to sort of the indigenous traditions here on earth, um, there is this belief. It was once sort of called animism. That, that term has fallen out of, out of favor, but there was once a belief that, you know, things like mountains and rivers and rocks, etc. That we were, you know, plants obviously and animals, but 
we would we would grant them a certain degree of personhood because they they still had sort of a spirit of their own and i think that if you really drilled down onto the consciousness question you might find if there's any objectivity to it that something similar is, is at play so the question is you know yeah mars looks like it's dead but even if you set aside the possibility of microbial life like would we necessarily recognize life for what it is i mean we're still having this question about whether or not these ai bots are alive you know or if they're conscious in that same sense and i think that it's such a it's such a loosely defined term um that that well, well you know, science you know that crowd right that stephen mm -hmm. hawking brian green richard dawkins you know Lawrence Krauss, you know, that whole, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that whole insane bunch of, uh, they, they, they all think that they're, they are smarter than everybody else. And that's a bad position to be in because they, they actually believe this. But if, if that it, what they think is that consciousness, which is fine, by the way, they think that consciousness is physical, it's chemistry. It's a chemical process, right? That it that there's a little piece of consciousness and everything, and you amass enough particles together that consciousness is a result of that, and that's what happens, you know, between our ears with our brains, right? right. That that it that it's a physical thing. It doesn't exist outside of the physical. Well, if that is the case, then yeah, those computers are sentient. Right? Yeah. They're they're made of particles. Software is sentient and 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 conscious, right? And and has consciousness. If if that is the position that they want to rest in, right? And that's yeah. that's a that's a difficult place to be. Well, and it, it begs the question if any sufficiently organized and complex system would become conscious, right? Um and you know, I sort of, I sort of push back on that a little bit because, as I, <laughs> it's a nice kind of segue, I guess. Um, you know, I mentioned the two things that that were in my true basket regarding these topics. Um, it's not quite in the basket, but it's sitting on the lip of the uh, the lip of the of the top, um, <laughs> about to fall in, is the near death experience. And uh, you know, I think that there's so much good evidence. Some of this testimony from the near death, from these near death experiences is does have a degree of veridicality. It can be confirmed. You have these stories of, you know, someone dying and they see an uncle that's not supposed to be dead, and they come back to life and they say, "Hey, Uncle Bobby is dead," and the family says, "Uncle Bobby's fine. Let's call up Uncle Bobby," and then they, they find out that he's he died while she, you know, this person was dead. And if you look at that near death experience stuff, I mean, it's. It does, I think that there is a strong suggestion in it that consciousness is non-local. Um, and, you know, I was uh, really hopeful because, you know, there was that literature, there were these papers that were published in The Lancet of all places by Pim Van Lommel, who did a bunch of near-death experience studies on cardiac arrest patients. And I was hoping that we would see more of uh, more of that discussion trending towards that possibility. And I haven't seen as much of it lately. I will say a couple of days ago on CNN, there was an article that uh, talked about near death experiences as well, but I always sort of defaulted back to that materialist reductivist uh, position of like, you know, oh, it's brain chemicals or hypoxia or something like that. But I guess what I'm, I said all that to say that that's part of the reason that I refute the idea that um, consciousness is sort of an epiphenomena of of materialist items coming together. I, I do think that it does have a non-local quality because that's certainly what aspects of the near-death experience seem to confirm in, in my reading of it, you know? Yeah. I saw that uh, same article that you're referring to on, on CNN and I, I got pretty excited. Well, I'm just glad that it was written. Okay. So it yeah. causes people to think, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Where the, the re the latest research into this, which comes from a doctor that just went through his experience and then he's gone and, and okay. So, um, but that uh, the conclusion, and I'm paraphrasing here because it, it's an excellently written article, it is. I, it is. but, but it's not my point of view. Okay. So, so <laughs> it's a good way to put me, it. Yeah. yeah. Let me, let me just say that out front. I need to have a disclaimer on that. Um, but, but that, what it is showing is that apparently 
without any measurement there that the brain continues to do its thing long after right. death when there's not any measured brain activity the, the the body's dead but apparently consciousness and thinking and observation uh, to to say all three things again in this show continue um, right. And that uh, the observation of one's body from outside of the body is part of this. And listening to doctors have a conversation about right. the patient or the observation of a nurse dropping something on the ground and then picking it up. Patient is dead for 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and anyway, she picks it, she drops a pen on the floor. She picks it up, puts it back on the tray. Dude. Heart starts beating, comes back to life, and comes back and and says, yeah, you know, uh, while I was dead, I saw you drop the scalpel on the floor, yeah. and you didn't wash it, and you still cut me with it. Well, how did you yeah. know that? Yeah, you didn't and, sterilize. You know, it's it's things and, and like your that. eyes are you know in some of these instances yeah. people's <laughs> eyes are covered, so it's not like they're somehow. Right. Besides right. being dead, could see it. Yeah. Right, you know, right, it, it, right. it's interesting. I, I did hear a, a, an interesting counterpoint because to me that that seems like for my own personal purposes, I realize that it's a big touchy topic that would you need a lot of evidence for to accept it at a, so, a, a societal level. But for my own personal purposes, like stories like that are enough. Like it's kind of settled for me. Um, but I did hear interesting um, an interesting alternative to that interpretation uh, on a podcast i can't remember which one a while back but it was one of the uh crowd from um sri who were talking about oh no that doesn't imply that consciousness persists after death the person was clairvoyantly seeing what was going to happen in the future in their surgery and then came back with the memory of it after they which to me seems a little bit too elaborate you know it does it's it's not it's sort of it sort of violates occam's razor right it's not the simplest uh the simplest explanation for what's going on there and and neither i would add are really some a lot of the the skeptical uh interpretations of the near-death experience they sort of end up violating occam's razor to a degree well and see and this is where um i i i want to use the word esoteric but the, but there is um there's an intangible uh, part of this that people do not want to discuss and do not want to contemplate, which is, and I'll get to it in a second, which is why the life after death question is something that we may not want the answer to. And there was a movie, and if we look at it in those terms, hear me out, just hear me out. There's a movie uh, I can't remember the name of it. It escapes me right now, but there's a movie with Robert Redford and um, I, I don't know, it's probably five years old or something. And he he's one of these, he's one of these, he's got, he's got like a cult, but he's mm. a doctor. And he proves the afterlife, right? He proves it, right? That there is, that, that's it. Life continues on forever. He proves it. And what what is what is one of the effects of that on the world it, the effect is with people that are like man i can't pay my electric bill this month yeah. well you know what screw it <laughs> right yeah I, i'm going to go to the other side and start yeah. over cuz this this life is a pain in the ass it doesn't have to be a cancer patient it doesn't have to be somebody that's got a broken heart or their wife left him or their husband left or whatever it is right mm -hmm. your dog died and you're bummed out and you you feel like uh this life just isn't worth it it's not even about that it's just like well, you know, if it goes on forever, okay, I gave this one a good run. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It was cool. It was cool. I'm I'm ready for a change. And yeah. that's 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 why the the possibilities of of this getting answered may not be, you know, there's a deep philosophical question here that we need to address, and nobody wants to talk about that part of it. Well, in, in that scenario, all your authority structures completely lose all power over you, right? Uh, completely, because, completely. Yeah, the um, threat, the threat is removed. Right. Yeah, uh, and and so that's 
that's why I kind of look at, you know, the possibility of the UFO question pertaining to that in some way. I don't, I'm not here to say exactly how, but there's enough indications here or there that these things are somehow linked. Um, you know, you can look at the Kenneth Ring stuff comparing alien abductions to near-death experiences and, you know, etc. If those things are linked, then it kind of makes me understand the hesitancy to disclose what we know about the UFO question. If if there's a link, like that's that's you know that's one of the things that I think might be holding back. Uh, you know what would suck. You know what would suck. So the afterlife is real, right? Life continues. You go to yeah. the other side. Yeah. You're like, screw it, man. You know, I have the IRS a hundred grand. <laughs> I win. You go to the other side. You go to the other side. You got a piece of mail waiting for you. Yeah, what is I keep it? track of you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, your, it's your IRS bill. What? So, in, yeah. in the after, wait, 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 wait. My car payment still do? It is. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. like, oh, man. It you sounds know. like a Philip K. Dick story, you know, <laughs> merging the bureaucracy with the. The supernatural, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So, and and what do we do with that if we go back? Um, uh, and you've written about this, but if if we go back into deep history, mm -hmm. where uh, Moses, Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments, right? He's he's off. He's on the top of the hill. He's uh, entangled. You like that? He's entangled with God. He's channeled, you know, and he comes down and he says, hey, you know what? I got 20 commandments here or 10 or whatever. Well, it's 20 originally, right, I think. And so anyway, I got 10 commandments. And uh, it, it, and he comes down. Is, is the angel, because we didn't have another word for it, is, is God, because we didn't have another word for it, is this uh, is something that, is throughout the universe. It is this contact with ET? And and you can't come down. Moses can't come down off of the mountain and go to his flock and go, oh, okay, so check this out. Dudes from Zeta Reticuli were just here. Mm. And they said, well, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know, the flock, the flock is gonna think Moses is crazy. But if mm -hmm. Moses says, so God said, then they pay attention, right? Mm -hmm. The angels came down and they spoke to me and they said, God said, oh, what, what did the angels say? Well, they said, don't eat pork. Okay. All right. I got that. I got that. What else? Do you, you know what I mean? Yeah, but you, yeah. can't, you can't say aliens. So right. is that historically, do you think that that's what has been repeated over and over again? I mean, yeah, so this is this is something that I, I run up to in my personal life as well, because I married the the daughter of a Southern Baptist preacher. So when I when I introduced the topic of, of looking at the UFO question through a religious lens, like it's like, oh, so you're saying that, you know, we should worship the UFOs or you're saying that, you know, God is an alien or something like that. And I'm like, that's not quite what I'm saying. I, I think that, again, in the, in the spirit of that sort of comparativism that I talked about, whatever the ufo is today oftentimes occupies that same place in the human heart that these older encounters with something other once did um and you know beyond that like i'm not sure if i can say that whatever this older intelligence was that you know the founders of of these older religions were encountering if they were like, you know, if they had any sort of physicality, there's something, there's something about this that is, that does seem non-physical. It does seem beyond the barrier. It also, ha again, as we sort of alluded to earlier, it does have this physical component as well, which is part of why it's so confounding. But, you know, there's also the idea that, uh, you know, there are all these references to the burning bush, specifically in this Moses example, there's this idea that maybe uh, there was a bush that was on fire and it was, you know, sort of releasing in, inhalable dimethyltryptamine and you know Moses was getting visions from that you know I, I suppose that my stance as a Christian should be that that is you know um, heresy but I, I really don't think it is because, because that stance would imply that there's nothing beyond 
what is seen in that state beyond just a, an hallucination, right? But I, I think that if you listen to enough of those stories about altered states of consciousness, there is somebody at the other end of that telephone. And, you know, I, I'm convinced after looking through all this stuff that this, this consciousness that we are able to tap into, this other, it seems like a place, it seems to have some sort of, you know, place, it seems to have some sort of destination, um, I, I do think it has an objective reality and there's something there and I don't know what to call it, but I think it's, I think we've called it a lot of things over time. Um, you know, the thing, the thing about viewing a lot of these older texts and sort of retrofitting them, retrofitting the UFO question to a lot of these older religions, you wind up with this sort of reductive, you know, Oh, they're all angels or, Oh, they're all demons. Um, you know, the inverse, as we've sort of talked about quite a bit on this, could be true as well. But that's why I always kind of stand back from, like, labeling it one thing or the other. But I do think that in terms of the way that that scenario unfolded, the way a lot of these different scenarios in the Old Testament especially unfolded, they are kind of a beat-for-beat beat description that you see in the lives of experiencers in Iowa in you know, 1970 or whatever. It, it, it seems to occupy the same place and the same function in our society, evolution, culture, spiritual right, life. Right, right, right. And, yeah, it, yeah. and it's not just Ohio, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just the swamp land of Louisiana that we're talking about. It's every culture on this planet, on every continent, for millennia that didn't, we don't have the excuse uh, in, in, you know, at 3000 BC or 2000 BC or 1000 BC of, of stories on the internet, mm -hmm. right. Of, of reading somebody yeah. else's book. You don't yeah. have that cross cultural contamination where the stories are nearly identical. Yeah. Very strange. Well, and, and, and it, it is a human birthright. It is, it is your birthright regard your your ability to contact this higher state of being is your birthright regardless of how high you are or or how short you are or how i said high i meant tall <laughs> how tall you are how short you are your gender your um religion your race none of these things matter it is your birthright being able to contact this other source and our our i believe our spiritual um higher nature um but that that you alluded to um that sort of how these stories have the same patterns and the same beats regardless of where they appear is part of what i find really compelling we were talking about that sort of personal disclosure that sort of personal knowing about the reality of these things that's that's how i arrived there because i looked at something my first book was on this sort of food taboo that you see uh between the fairy legends about not eating food in fairyland or you'll be trapped there. And similar legends that you see amongst some of the tribes of Alaska regarding one of their Bigfoot analogs, the bequest. If you eat food from the bequest, you'll be trapped with the bequest forever. And I'm like, this is the same story. It's the same story. It's, <laughs> it's 100%. Yes, yes, and, yes. And and you literally can't get, you almost literally can't get farther from each other on the globe in terms of these populations. So to me, that it has to be one of three things, right? It has to mean that either A, there was a lot more cultural and trade exchange between the old world and the new world in antiquity than we recognize, which is wild if that's the case, right? Or it means that things like the collective unconscious and archetypes, these ideas that can be transmitted across cultures without any actual interaction is a real thing. You know, we all come pre, as a human being, you come uh, pre-downloaded with a bunch of software in your head, right? So that's option number two. Or the option that obviously you and I like best, that there is an objective reality to these things. Because yeah, that, I, I, Pino yeah. that Pinocchio was real. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. that's the that's the third <laughs> yeah. choice, right? Yeah. That's the third choice. And when we look at it, it's not just, you know, people need to understand it's it's ancient Egyptian text, it's ancient Greek text, it's ancient Chinese text and Japanese text and Sumerian text and from India, Aboriginal, right? And North Central South America, Maya, Incan. It doesn't matter. All cultures talked about the exact same thing. So either, you know, it's programmed in our DNA and we are going to 
uh, imagine the same stuff eventually in our evolution. Right. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. That's an easy thing. We all, uh, we all invented windows and staircases. Right, that that, it, it, that that happened naturally on all the continents at about the same time. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I I or or consciousness and and telepathy and and entanglement and interdimensionality is a real thing. Yeah, I mean that's that's something that I always try to emphasize, and I mentioned this a bit in Ecology of Souls Part One. You know, there are these ideas that I wholly refute that you know one culture that was worldwide. Um, you know, in some of the nastier corners of research, you'll see people claim it was a master race was going from continent to continent and building these ancient monuments and pyramids and stuff. And I say, okay, that's that's one icky way to look at it, right? I think that what's happening here, I refute that completely. I think that's what's, what's I happening don't. here. I don't, well, I don't well, by the way. I, don't. I, think that, I think that's what's happening. What's happening here is that they are all built by the same race, which is the human race. Because ah. this represents because this represents a technology, as you were talking about stairs, et cetera. This represents a technology right. that was arrived upon because it works like a bow and arrow. Like these okay, technologies. you needed you needed an out clause. <laughs> that's all. Well, so, so, oh, that's but, what, what, but what I'm hoping, what I'm hoping, is, I'm, I'm making clear is that like North American tribes made the mounds, and they resemble uh, they resemble monuments from the old world because they represent a technology with communing with this other realm that we all sort of arrived upon. At the same time, much like something like the bow and arrow or stairs <laughs> or things like that, like right. it, it, we we got there because it works, and it's only in the millennia since then that we have figured out that it that, that we have lost track of, of exactly how it works. So, you know, and I think it just speaks to the what I'm trying to get at there is that it, it's a universality that every culture and every race has arrived at because uh, if you look back through, there's this great researcher named Gregory Shushan who are um, who has done comparative analyses between uh, you know indigenous cultures, stories of of the afterlife and near death experiences, and ancient texts uh, comparing comparing their descriptions of near-death experiences and it's you know his his books are some of the most jaw-dropping things you've ever read because they are so consistent from culture to culture i mean obviously it's not a 100 match on every point but it it is it is this um it is this this congruency that you see some really specific details from uh you know ancient mesopotamia that appear in you know ancient south america and and it, it implies to me that there is a there is a shared human birthright reality to accessing this other this other world yeah you know that's more fantastical than bigfoot being interdimensional <laughs> it it uh, is no, it is serious. no it is I'm, it I'm, is I'm, you're you're really that's a big ask Oh, it's an ask that I agree with, by the way, but that's a big ask. And th there's another problem that we have. If that is indeed the case, and and I don't want to go into the, man, you've said reductionist, but I kind of have to go there a, a, a little bit. If, if we go into that, uh, that part of thought, of, 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 that, of, of that thought process, there's a problem with that. And the problem is, is fundamental. The problem is that the world didn't start at 3000 BC, but that's what Orthodox academia wants us to understand that it all rests right there in Giza in, in Mesopotamia. And then you can swing over and give some credit to India and we can uh, swing it over to Australia, but everything is, is is that number right? There's nothing to see at, before 3000 BC mm -hmm. that it was Stone Age man, and and even the Neolithic uh, side of things, the newer Stone Age man was still wearing animal skins. Yeah, and they then Gobekli still... Tepe comes in, and uh, then then Gobekli Tepe <laughs> yeah, comes yeah. along, predating everything by seven thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand years. Mm -hmm. And if you throw that into the mix, then who taught? 
because everything is taught. Who taught the builders of Gobekli Tepe how to quarry? Right? Yeah. Agriculture, organization. They had a town. They were able to feed. They had organization. They had engineering. They had mathematics. They apparently had astronomy. Uh, <laughs> a pretty good foundation in philosophy, I think, was all going on 7,000 years before. Now, yeah. that doesn't make sense. And, and so that presents kind of what you're saying there, but that there must have been the civilization that goes back into deep, deep, deep antiquity that did teach the builders of the world how to do things. Well, and, and I think it was one of the people who discovered a place like places like good Beckley Tepe um, have mentioned is the fact that it was our first priority because Gobekli Tepe was does seem to have been a ritual site. You know, it's it's not a farm, it's not a a city. It is a ritual site. It is a site for communing with the other world. That was our first priority before we learned to become agrarian. Our first priority was contacting this other realm, and 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 I think that that says a lot about. The human, the priorities of human beings, and I think it says a lot about our our fundamental nature. The fact that one of when we had the chance to make this, and I'm sure we'll find earlier stuff we always do, but like when we when we had the chance to make something and put down what appear to be roots, we made a temple. Like <laughs> I think that's just so amazing to me. Yeah. Well, and it, it's not. We can call it a temple. We don't know what it is. You know, we don't know. Is is it astronomical? Is it is it for the seasons? Is it some type of clock? Right? Uh, they, it, it could be a lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, we don't know. Um, there is another part. Uh, well, there's a few things about. There's a thousand things about go back. <laughs> right. Right. Way. But but when you don't have um, any bodies. Mm -hmm. Right. There's yeah. no, no, there's so there's no ritual burying or there's nothing like that going on. Uh, number one. Number two, there are no weapons. Right. Mm -hmm. So they weren't fighting over this site. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have you have that element. There isn't any de depictions of deities. So mm -hmm. that's kind of strange, too, as well. And then you throw in the the, the they buried it. And walked away. It's like, wait, wait, wait. Right. I never, and, and apparently never came back. And there are multi, there are multiple levels of those stone circles. Right. So we're we're only looking at the the newest, right? The right. last part that was buried, right. and it continued. So how old are we getting here? Yeah, it, we're it, already it, yeah. we're, we're already at the last at the end of the last ice age. That that that's firmly been dated. Yeah. And we're comfortable with that. Ten thousand BC. Ten thousand BC. Yeah, it's who nuts. was? Yeah, who was carving three D relief? Yeah, not carving into the stone, but removing the stone and leaving the image behind. That's nuts to me. That's not Stone Age, man. No, that's, that's something pretty highly intelligent. And it does speak to the possibility that. You know, numerous civilizations have achieved levels of technological advancement, and you know, uh, maybe in the in the cataclysmic sort of idea, have been reset to a certain degree. That's also sort of predicated on this idea that advancement is this sort of straight line, and it's probably not that to begin with. But um, or right, or or, right, or it implies right, right. or it implies that you know these ancestors of ours, as I would argue, sort of put different emphases on on things that we don't put the same emphasis on today right <laughs> like they they might have been capable of of doing doing some of the things that we have and it just wasn't a priority for them because they were busy interfacing with again that other world yeah um well, it's 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 a fascinating site though i just yeah it, it, it is and it, it it is not the last discovery right now no. what do we what do we do what if we do if we go deep deep Right. What do we do if we find something where we start carbon dating? Uh, I, I'm talking about technology, right? We we find buildings, we find a city, and it's it's a hundred thousand years old. 
you know, it's it, it's yeah. what what are we going to do then? And it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. It reminds me um, uh, the the great word since we've been quoting uh, people uh, all night. Uh, Leonard Susskind. He 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 he's he's one of the brightest uh, physicists out there. Okay, and his arguments uh, about black holes and and quantum physics and, and and things are just phenomenal. I have a deep respect for his atheist ass. But I'll say this about <laughs> it. I'll say this. Leonard said uh, this. Everything will happen. Right? Yeah. Everything. No matter what you think, no matter the most impossible Right. And he gives this example. Right. He says this. You have a bowl of oatmeal and you knock it off the counter and the bowl hits the floor and shatters and the oatmeal spreads across the floor. And as you're looking at the shattered bowl and the oatmeal, it then reverses itself and all of the atoms come back together. And the bowl reassembles and floats up and lands on the counter. Sounds impossible, but one day it will happen. happen. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, and, and, and think, look at like and that. Turn, well, and, 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 and that's, and, and, well, it sounds even better read in your, it sounds even better in your voice. I mean, I hope you know yeah. that. <laughs> but, but, um, but you know what? That, that also puts me in the, but, but that puts me in the mindset of something that I was thinking about as we were discussing this is like, you know, we have this idea that we're at the pinnacle of technological innovation right now. And you and I know that's not true. It's going to get, we're going to relearn all sorts of things. So it, it is that sort of idea that, everything will happen. Like we're going to relearn ideas that we just once took completely for granted. And similarly, if we look back into the past, just like we both agree, like we're going to keep finding things that are older. Like I, I think that there's almost no end in sight on other, on either end of the timeline. Um, and you know, that's opening up the can of worms of us even understanding what time is, which I am pretty sure we do not. Um, but yeah, well, I, I, yeah, yeah, nobody's figured that out yet. So let me tell you something, Joshua. If you've got that figured out, let me know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Geez. Let me know. Let Small me know task. So can, Small yeah, task. So I, can, yeah. so I can steal it. So I can steal it. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 really really true. And if we, if we, one of the things that uh, I love this thought experiment, right? It, it, where. It's mentioned uh, it, when we talk about E.T., that if E.T. is like us, how do we know that they've even survived? You know, once they get the bomb and, you know, right. and technology reaches a level, they kill themselves off and technology takes over. And that's what's going to happen to us. So let's say that that does happen to us. All right. Let's say that Kim Fatty Fat over North Korea you know, it just starts to mess things up. And the next thing you know, and then the next thing you know, and at the same time, an asteroid hits the earth. And at the same time, a CME launches in and, 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 and that's it. And we are done. Yeah. Right. Okay. We're done. Fade to done. black. <laughs> done. Fade to black. It's Fade over. Black. It's over. A yeah. hundred thousand years from now. Do we, do we jumpstart ourselves? Does life start again? Well, yeah. I mean, this that we've had many, many uh, six that we know of yeah. situations where everything has ended and and restarted here on Earth. Would there be evidence of you and I a uh, hundred thousand years from now, two hundred thousand years from now, a million years from now? Is there any evidence of us? Probably not. Yeah. No, I, I would say that there isn't. I mean, that's one of the funniest things that I always see about these post-apocalyptic films is they're, t you know, sometimes they're set 500 years in the future and you can still see remnants of buildings and stuff or like, or books or something. And I'm like, uh, I'm not sure how much, you know, I'm not that, sure. I'm because, not sure. because maintenance is a thing, you know, you have to maintain things, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it, especially when you get into, time scales in the thousands of years like i think it all goes away pretty quickly there was that television show on history or something it was like after people yeah yeah after us really, after you know, us after or something us, like that yeah. 
Yeah, after people, no. I love that show. Yeah, you know, well, and, and again, it comes it comes down to the fact that these our our ancestors, you know, regardless of where they come from, um, you know, what continent or whatever, our ancestors might have been using technology that we don't recognize as technology today. You know, um, there's that there's that constant uh, discussion of diorite and how it was used in Egypt, and, and you know, and how it's difficult to replicate today even with diamond drills and things like that and it sort of points to a civilization that used stone in the way that we use plastic and the idea of us wrapping our heads around that i mean underwater concrete wasn't that do we still we still have no idea how that how the romans made underwater concrete if memory serves or there are other examples like that where just these technologies have been lost to time and that's even if we're just looking at technologies in the way that we see them as technologies as opposed to a lot of these indigenous technologies which circle around which you know uh, center around medicines and plant work and, and stuff like that so i think that um a lot of what has happened is, is destined to remain a mystery, but we'll, we'll keep finding little hints here and there. I do think. Well, when do you, when you look at it, it's such a great point, and I, I love this point. Uh, just look at for, forget about the Great Pyramid, forget about Gobekli Tepe, put those on the back burner. Friggin' Cusco, yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. That man, if 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 that is an example of. Um, they did it just because they could, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. The, the ability to work that stone. We we look at it as hard as hard stone, you know, quarrying, cutting, mm -hmm. moving. The, I'm not so sure that that was the case. I don't know, man. They might have been mixing chemicals Cord together. Cord stone or something. I mean, human beings yeah, yeah. are, that is the human being, that is the superpower of the human being is its ability to adapt and innovate. That is our one superpower as a species. And we are capable of some amazing things. Um, and I'm sure we've been capable of some amazing things far in the past that we just have completely lost touch with because, oh, it's easier with a bulldozer or it's easier with a silicon microchip or any number of things. But it, it might be easier, but it might also not be as you know lasting. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Egypt uh, next week. Nice. Uh, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's amazing. And I was watching. Uh, I'm so excited to go back. But I was watching this documentary. It's brand new. It's a series on one of the the things, and uh, might have even been Netflix. I, I don't know, I, but it was last week, and they were putting a statue of Ramses the Second at the entrance of the Luxor Temple. Okay, now I've I've been to the Luxor Temple, and mm -hmm. it's pretty awesome. Okay, right. It's got that sixty foot obelisk. It's like great, right? Whatever you know, three thousand tons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just gnarly. Anyway, so you should see them struggle with this statue, trying to get it upright. Right, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, dude. They got they got they got an army of engineers. Yeah. Of very big machines, cranes and bulldozers and this and levers and that, welders and, and then straps and, da, 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 and they couldn't get it up. They, they so they get it up. They and, and, and they needed the right angle because his eyes need to be level to look at the. There's oh, all this Egyptian the fine tuning, yeah, right, right. And they they get it up finally, right, and it it's wrong. So they had to bring it back down, right? They had to bring it back down. And the struggle, right? Now, think about the original. You know, think about that. How did they couldn't, and this statue is, is, I don't know, it's probably 30 feet tall or 20 feet tall. It's big. It's red granite. It's heavy. I understand that. They're doing it next to that friggin' obelisk, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How did, how did they get that here from Aswan? And how did they get that upright? And you guys can't do this with a crane that can lift 100 tons. Yeah, I mean, just this, just simply saying manpower um, is not a, a, a sufficient answer. Um, and, you know, it, it might be something deceptively simple. Like, I've seen a, a compelling argument for how the pyramids were made using a series of interlocking 
moats and locks, like, you know, and, and floating stones up. I'm not sure exactly how, how it would work, but just the level of ingenuity. Um, I, I think that we in our modern world have lost sight of problem solving in that same way. We really have. Well, wait, okay. Uh, let's, uh, let's, you know what? I'm going to apologize uh, uh, to Adrian. He's listening right now. And and to others, uh, I I blew through the commercial tonight, and, uh, oh, and, and, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having too much fun <laughs> talking. Sorry. So uh, just let me say this: everybody, uh, go and get your tickets uh, to Stairway to the Stars. The links are below. It's in November at the Luxor Hotel, uh, put on by uh, a Disclosure Fest and Fade to Black. And uh, so everybody, the tickets are below. I, I forget if you go to my website, if you go to uh, jimmychurchradio.com, the discount code is there in the ad and you can go and get discounted tickets. Okay. So, um, but if you, if you could have a time machine and, and, and jump on it, would you, where would you go? Would you, would you go to Egypt and see how they actually did build the pyramids? Would you go to Cusco and see how they were molding that clay into hard stones? I don't know. Uh, do you go to the resurrection? Do you go see if Jesus was real? Um, or do you go? Do you go into the future? Where Where do you go? Man, I I, I don't want to go to the resurrection. Um, you know, I think that I think that. Much in the same way that I kind of don't want the UFO to be solved, I don't want to know exactly what happened. Um, Fair enough. Uh, if that makes any sense, you know, on a sort it of does. It makes a lot level. of sense. So I, I, I would probably, I would probably go back to go back to Tepe. I mean, it's just so fascinating when you put its its distance from the pyramids um, into perspective. As as far as what's what's the saying? Um, we are closer in time to the creation of the pyramids than the pyramids were to Gobekli Tepe. It's just by orders of magnitude. Like it's, it, it really would be fascinating to see. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that would be probably my choice, obviously influenced by our discussion, but that would probably be my choice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I, but you know, uh, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going pyramids. I'm going pyramids. I'm going, but you know, here's the problem with it. Let me tell you what the problem is. You need to have an exact date. Okay. So, right. Right. If you're time traveling, you don't want to go to uh, 2800 BC to see the pyramids get built and have them already be there. Yeah. You don't want them. You don't want to be there for the capstone. Yeah. Right. Like, they're, they're already built. You know, right? like, yeah. 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 At least with Gobekli Tepe, we've got carbon dating. So yeah. you can kind of, you know, you can get plus or well, minus, you know. And, and the question, as we alluded to, is also what went on there, you know. So you just arrive sometime during its use and you'll kind of, be privy to some secrets, I guess. Now, what do you do? Okay, so you show up at Gobekli Tepe, and frigging Abraham is there oh, with geez. Joseph. You know, some crazy. Yeah. Abraham's birthplace is like it's right at the road, right? It's right. it's like it's like thirty miles away from uh, Gobekli Tepe, and there's a lot of ancient, ancient, you know, actual history right there on the Syrian yeah. uh, Turkish border. Mm -hmm. Um, which has nothing to do with Syria and has nothing to do with Turkey. It just happens to be where where it is today. But yeah, what I mean, what if you do go back and, and there's somebody walking around with a staff, Ark of the Covenant, some some crazy, you know? What do you what do you do? What do you do? You know, I, I suspect that like because so much of what we know about the past is sort of stitched together. I, I suspect that no matter when you went back and what you looked at, you'd find something that was really confronting, honestly. Um, especially if you're going that far back, or even if you went back to the pyramids, like you'd see something that was like, I had no idea. This has never been in any of my books. <laughs> you know, it's it's never been mentioned anywhere. I, just, you know, I, I suspect that there would be something like that, regardless of where you went. So, I mean, that would be especially confronting. It would also sort of be two birds with one stone because I get to answer a historical question and a religious question if the Ark of the Covenant's there or something, you know, or, or or you know, there is a, there's an Old Testament figure there. So yeah, that would be that would be wild. Um, but yeah, you know, I just, yeah, I just I just, but I kind of default back to, I kind of, I don't want to say I don't want to know because that sounds incurious, but um, 
you know, I, I just, I sometimes wonder if I had a time machine, if I wouldn't go back to like just one of where one of my favorite UFO sightings would have been like 10 minutes beforehand, right? <laughs> just so I can see what, see what happened. Like go back to, go back to Eagle River, Wisconsin, right before Joe Simonton was handed his space pancakes and, and you know, see what would, what actually happened. Um yeah, Kenneth Arnold, you know, yeah. uh, and, yeah. and the airplane. Yeah, that would be uh, obviously Roswell would be cool, or, or, uh, or you know, a, a, a small cabin in upstate New York on December twenty sixth, nineteen eighty six. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that would be yeah. a pretty happening thing. I I just want to see Whitley fire off that gun in his living room. If that um, he says <laughs> yeah. that never happened, by the way, he said okay. that didn't happen. That no, it was just for the movie. But what about? Uh, Travis Walton, that would be yeah. uh, pretty good. That That'll would be, be yeah. That would be uh, that would be pretty amazing. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. Aurora, Texas, yeah, eighteen ninety seven. Um, Battle of L.A. Battle of L.A. is a good one. That's um, a Rendlesham Forest. Yeah, <laughs> that would that would that would answer a lot of questions, wouldn't it? Um, Man, would you like to be a fly on the wall with that one? Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, how about uh, if we we can continue the Ariel School? Yeah. Right. And uh, think about that in Africa. What about um, uh, Westall in Australia? The the school kids over there. Yeah. Um, or just you know some of those some of those places um, when the Iron Curtain came down. You know, in the 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 uh, glasnost wave that Jacques Vallée talked about, you know, the, the story of the school children with the, I think it was the headless robot that grabbed them. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that story. Yes. Yes. Was, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, trying to remember where that was, but uh, I mean, yeah, it was just, it, or, or, you know, just bluff Creek right before Roger and Pat rode up on their horses. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just well, see. okay. So um, uh, I like this. This is a, a, a great way to look at things because Nuremberg, right? 1500s oh, yeah, and, yeah. and going yeah. back to the, the, that, that weekend for the, uh, for the woodcut. <laughs> yeah, Dealey Plaza, you know, <laughs> again, yeah. like I, I think that, I think that, uh, that the res the uh, crucifixion would be pretty low on my list, but yeah, we could just answer a bunch of questions. It'll be nice. Thank you so much, Joshua. What a great show. Where can everybody go and chase you down? Uh, you can find links to all my stuff at joshuacutchin.com. That's J O S H U A C U T C H I N dot com. Uh, my latest nonfiction book, talking about the topics that we've been talking about tonight, is Ecology of Souls, Volume One and Volume Two, as well as a. Uh, a book that's just full of notes and bibliography. Um, and uh, you can reach out to me there. I, I do offer signed copies at a little bit of a discount. So signed by me. So, um, and uh, my latest book is a, uh, is a novel entitled them old ways never died. And I also have copies of that as well. So it's been great talking to you, Jimmy. It's been a man, long it's time. About time. Yeah. 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 It, it's about time. And I look forward to our next conversation, man. Be safe and be well. I know you're on the East Coast, and it's late over there. Thank you for staying up late with us. It was a great night. Thank you so much, Joshua. Absolute pleasure. Behave and be well, my friend. JoshuaCutchen.com, and uh, the links are below. We've got them over on the website. We've got them throughout social media. Go and check out all of his books. And with that, I am going to get out of here. What's going on here tomorrow night? Oh, Tomorrow night, Kathleen Ball is with us. We're going to be talking about the Knights Templar in Brazil. That is tomorrow night right here on Fade to Black. I'm your Jimmy Church. Great show. I want to remind everybody what's going on. We have five shows this week. So, yes, Friday night, very special event with Melissa Tittle. That will be talking about the Peruvian mummies. And there was a press release that came out today on that. We'll be covering that on Friday. Thursday night is uh, Linda Moulton Howe. Tomorrow night, Kathleen Ball. Thank you, Joshua. Great show tonight. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin. Webmasters, Drew the Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boys, spaceboymusic.com. 
Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Kathleen Ball, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.